morning. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our next session as part of the Smart Mobility Summit here at Industry City. Today, we're going to this session will be looking at how does delivery beyond speed. How, sorry, how does delivery beyond speed get enhanced through the use of mobile technologies? We'll be looking at smart inventory, looking at various different implementations of logistics, and very much exploring the logistics and services beyond connectivity and how that can be enhanced through that integration. So I'd like to welcome on, onto the stage Mark Thurman from IBM, who will be the uh, moderator for this panel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to invite my panelists to come up. And as they take their seats, uh, we'll all introduce ourselves. Let's pick a seat. Excellent. So before my panelists introduce themselves, we might try and do something a little bit different at, <laughs> in the middle or in the end. If anybody has a question, a good question, because we're going to select only the good ones, let us know. Um, I think Irene or one of our colleagues will have uh, a microphone so you can ask a specific question. If not, and you'd like to talk to any of us at the end, We'll all gather at the end here because typically you might want to have a one-on-one uh, -on -one exchange or uh, exchange business cards. So with that, I'll reintroduce myself. I'm Mark Thurman. I'm from IBM. I work in the CTO's office for cloud, and I look after innovation and very large uh, initiatives. Morning, everyone. I'm Gopi. Uh, I work for Axiata, uh, MNO based out in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and I run the enterprise business for the group. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Tahira Kool. I'm uh, the Global Vice President for Dassault Systems working in business services, which is logistics and financial services. Very pleased to be here. Alan. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Hicks. I'm the CTO at Manage Drone Delivery. Um, we are a drone delivery business uh, that are delivering consumer-facing goods to consumers uh, currently fully operating out of Ireland. Well, hi, my name is Gianluca Redolfi. I'm the CCO at Satellite IoT. At Satellite IoT, what we're doing is um, making sure that satellite connectivity for IoT can be for any use case everywhere in the world. Hi, I'm uh, Nicola Lesconek. I'm in charge of partnerships for Soracom. We provide uh, IoT connectivity services. Excellent. Thank you, panelists, and welcome. And again, welcome to our, our audience. And Thank you again to the AV team and the uh, GSMA staff for uh, helping us out today. So one thing that f initially emerges is we've got a satellite provider, we've got a drone provider, and as I've walked through the, the, uh, the event, I've seen that these are two big themes, is drones, mm -hmm. there's uh, drones all over the place, we have one on our stand, and also satellite. So maybe we, we'll jump in on the importance of uh, satellite, satellite with IoT, and the mixture with cellular. Yeah, so at, at Satellite IoT, we've always been thinking that it's not correct that satellite communication is not available to everybody. There's something extremely expensive and not accessible. So since the beginning, we have been saying uh, there should be a way to make it standardized and that the device that you need to use to connect to satellite have to be really inexpensive, and that anybody can buy it, and anybody can use it, okay? And that has been the purpose of what we've been uh, doing since the beginning. Uh, this passed through having uh, <coughs> a new standard approved by the 3GPP, which is the new release 17, and this allows that to actually the cellular devices that are connected now to cellular on IoT to also connect without any change to, to the satellites. So we launch our own constellation, and we are working as a natural um, extension of network for the mobile network operators. And that's a key thing, because now drones or any, any 
different application can finally use IoT even where there's no cellular coverage. So we've got two operators actually, yeah. uh, SORCOM at one end, you've got a large uh, footprint. Uh, what's, what's your feeling about including satellite into, into your offer? So we've used multi-mode to try and connect onto all of our logistics uh, solutions which we've had. Uh, specifically, examples like in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, demining, as in active mines which were there through the war years, need to be removed. Uh, and logistics become a huge part of that because getting fuel into these machines, mm -hmm. which are sort of demining, getting people into the right sort of locations in uh, and getting the actual mines out is not an easy challenge. Right. So we've used cellular networks, we've tried to use private networks, we would include things like satellite networks onto that to be able to map that out. And that's really sort of brought the efficiencies of being able to demine, be very clear about those areas which need to, to get uh, um, uh, cleaned out, uh, and just the safety of people within that type of a logistics uh, environment. Right. So you would you, you would use both standard, uh, you know, licensed and unlicensed networks in a in a mixed offering. Uh, both licensed, where it's already been rolled out, and a lot of private networks okay. with private LTE. Okay. Uh, and which, small pockets. Which would be microphone. licensed I, I, yeah. in any event. Yes. Okay. So, Soricom, what's your view of this whole matter? <laughs> yeah. So. Satellite is uh, an interesting ex extension because our panel discussion is about beyond speed. So speed is great, but ubiquity of service, of coverage is key as well. And those non-terrestrial options are a great way to guarantee a continuity of service or service in areas that are not covered by terrestrial networks. So at Soracom, we are looking at expanding our footprint <coughs> through uh, satellite providers, be it licensed, unlicensed. We already provide access through traditional cellular networks, LPWA, LPWA networks as well, unlicensed in some cases, and we also provide um, connections for IP-based devices because most of the times, customer use cases will require hybridation of the connectivity. There is no customer use case that will require only one flavor of connectivity, but the whole game is to abstract this complexity and to provide an actual service to the end customer, whatever Whatever the it is. The of the communicating devices and so on. No, it makes perfect sense. So Tahera, <coughs> role of standards. You want to want to touch that one? <laughs> oh, well, yes. You, um, can, you can say no. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> Ask me anything. <laughs> I just did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You have right across the logistics world, um, whether it's rail, air, sea, cargo, freight, you have different standards that uh, obviously have to be met. And as the gentleman over there talked about uh, and the data that's coming from all of these different technologies, that's already a challenge in itself. Mm -hmm. So bringing together all of that data to meet with the standards that are out there that keep changing, that are different depending on which um, uh, geography you're in, uh, is also is a is a big challenge. Um, yeah, that's yeah. no makes sense. Yeah. So Alan, drones. Yeah. How do you connect these damn things? <laughs> is, it, is it all on cellular? Are you doing Wi-Fi? So so, so at at the moment it's it's all cellular. Our particular drones are cellular. And um, what we've discovered is that that's the best connectivity choice. It's the lowest cost of entry, and it's the it's the most broadly available. Um, regulators do like the idea of using satellite as a backup, but it's costly, um, the latency is pretty poor on it at the moment. Um, I mean, f from looking around the conference um, over the last few days, I mean, it feels like there's a lot of exciting things that are going to happen. I mean, 5G is going to be huge for drones in terms of reliability and connectivity, um, and that might replace the need for dual, for, for, for multimodal, be it uh, LTE and, and um, satellite. Um, but I think what the telcos and the comms industry would need to deliver for drones is a turnkey solution that has the redundancy baked in because drones have enough things going on right. that reliable connectivity would be a major piece to solve. And so latency would be an issue? La latency is a big issue. I mean, if, you're, if, if a drone is making a maneuver um, and you need to make a decision, um, the lower the latency and the lower guaranteed latency is, is, is what's really important. Um, that allows you to, to decide whether you do your compute on board which is, you know, 
great, but it's expensive if you've got a massive fleet um, versus offboard. So if you've got that connectivity piece, it actually reduces the economics of the problem. So are you relying on anything at the edge as a result to kind of lower your, your uh, ingest endpoint, your drone pricing? Yeah. And, and is that available everywhere that you operate? And, 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 and this is, so today it is, but that obviously limits the footprint of, of what you can do. So today we're doing more onboard our drones than we would like to do in the future. Okay. Um, and that is because of, sometimes you can get really great connectivity and sometimes you can't. Right. And, and there's no, consistency is, is the problem. If you knew it was always going to be slow, you could accommodate and work right. around it. Um, but it's that inconsistency that's a real challenge. How do you guys accommodate drones? You've got you've got a <laughs> wide and varied footprint. Yeah, um, and I think I mean I thought I won't use the word 5G, but that's really sort of what it's designed for, uh, in sort of short bursts of data, but very quick, as opposed to sort of broad coverage which you get for consumers to to do that. Uh, we try multiple mechanisms to try and you know guarantee some sort of bandwidth for industrial type usages. Uh, we haven't done it very extensively for agriculture or drones per se, uh, but you know, in multiple use cases, we've tried to, to do that at least for smart manufacturing, industrial type of applications to do that, where the environment's slightly more controlled as opposed to, I guess, with a drone, you have a maybe two kilometer radius or so to, to work with, which just becomes a bit more challenging. Yeah, but I mean, I think th like the, the number one challenge and the reason that we don't have thousands of drones in the sky or mobile taxi or you know unmanned taxis it's not that like you could make this stage fly it would it would look ugly and it wouldn't fly very well and it wouldn't be very aerodynamic but you can do it so the challenge with technology isn't getting the drones in the sky the challenge is how do you coordinate all of those drones autonomously so uh, coordinating a fleet and and that rely or, or that a swarm exactly and that relies on comms um, and okay. because n not all of the drones in the swarm will be from one provider, there'll be multi-carriers um, or multi-drone providers. Uh, so, uh, it, this is kind of the notion of you know cellular V to X, but in the air, yeah. in a sense. And, and is there a standard around that, or is that you guys are just throwing these things up there and make sure they don't collide? <laughs> so, so, so there are sta there are That's the question, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are standards evolving, um, as, as with everything. Um, and the ASTM organization has published a very, very good UTM standard which is you know unmanned traffic management systems um, and there's things like remote ID and different sensing technology um, that is coming to help all of this but again it all relies on this fabric of of them um, of comms it makes perfect sense so the reason we're doing all these things is to get a, a bunch of data so I guess the big question is how do we put the data in context and I know Tahira, that's a question you and I discussed, so <coughs> I'll let you start, and then maybe we'll go yeah. see how our colleagues feel about that topic. Sure, yeah. I mean, I mean think data, data is everywhere, right? It's coming to at us at speed. Um, I like to call it the five Vs of the big data. You have volume, you have uh, velocity, you have veracity, you have variety, and you have value. And we spend a lot of time collecting that data, disseminating, integrating, storing that data, but we don't spend enough time deriving the value from that data. And that's one of the challenges when you talk about you know, drones and different modes of transport, right. intermodal, uh, and you've got data coming from your fixed assets, your rail yards, your, your um, uh, storage sites, um, and so on. How do you manage all that data? And that's where you know, we talk about virtual twin, to put that data into context. Makes sense. So Nicholas, how do you enable all of this? You've got a, a, a you know, great network. You, you know, you're able to bring together networks from all over. Is data a relevant thing for your, for your team to manage? Yep, exactly, and I love your several of these. Yeah, we have to write down all the Vs. Yeah. I, I forgot I will most just of them speak already. About the last one, which is the, maybe the key one, which is value. And that the key equation that we need to solve and to help our customers solve is, so data is all, all around us. Ex we have a lot of untapped resource, to, uh, raw resource to extract from the physical world. Our goal is to help our customers make it so that the total cost of extracting and using this data is below the actual value of it. 
which has been a challenge so far. So that's why beyond acting merely as a connectivity provider, we try to work as partners with our customers and helping them solve this TCO equation and making sure that these total costs remain good enough and the financial equation works. So it could be reducing the amount of data you actually emit, because then you'll reduce your energy spending, you'll reduce your data spending, which is somehow counterintuitive as the MVNO, which we are. But using those services, you can then build something that actually makes sense and that is going to work in the long run and don't, uh, let's say, die in the valley of death of the IoT POCs and so on that we've spoken a lot over the last few years. Ah, uh, the, the deadly POC. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I got the same question to you on, on from a satellite perspective. What do you, what do you, are, you, are you just facilitating the ingest of the data or the control of the device? Or are you doing anything useful with the data? We just pass over the data. Okay. But there's something very nice, actually. So you're like a trusted carrier, essentially. Yes. We, uh, your transport. Exactly. But we are um, focused on what we call massive uh, IoT, which is millions, billions of IoT that you can connect. And this, we believe, can just uh, happen uh, with something called narrowband IoT. And it's message-based. And it's completely different than what we have in mind, because we're not talking about gigabyte, megabyte, kilobyte, we're talking about bytes. Mm. Talk about messages, l very likely around 30, 35 bytes that the IoT device is sending out. So that's, it's, is the pipe uh, broken? Is the, the something not working? Is the it, alarm it, go off? Well, it, it can be monitoring on agriculture. So it can be different level temperatures, different levels uh, under the soil, uh, the, the soil level and up, uh, wind, uh, the moisture and so on. And with all this grid of information, uh, there are companies that they can provide better information to the, uh, to the farmer. Actually, they, they promise 30 to 40 percent increase in production if it's done correct. So we're just taking this information from everywhere it is That's back to the core network. But the key thing here is that they don't need to send gigabyte. Right. With just a few bytes, and that's the case where uh, less is more, <laughs> take what we really need, okay. analyze it, and you probably have a lot. So uh, again, same question to you, if you don't mind. So we, our operator, LinkNet in Indonesia, provides the broadband connectivity for the East Java industrial plat, uh, plant for the area full of uh, manufacturers within it. The initial attraction for them were you know, tax breaks that they had new pieces of land to, to build upon. We brought a lot of high speed broadband connectivity to all of them. Uh, and what we soon realized is that we could start connecting a lot of the cameras and, and you know, installations around it, as well as the water table or water levels within Jakarta. Maybe most are familiar. It's a bit you know, like Holland or, or Amsterdam where the water levels are, are pretty high. That started to affect the logistics of uh, movement within the industrial park. So we correlated information from the cameras and those areas, and that's just made the logistics within the center a lot more efficient than what it right. is. So now the attraction for people to relocate into those areas are because the, pl the whole um, industrial sites a lot more efficient compared to you know, other comparable ones. So would you leverage a digital twin type technology? Yes, we would. I mean, we're trying to do small POCs around that to, to do that, but there's a lot of basic sort of connectivity to get up right. to, to be able to get to that purpose. Because I, I know in, in uh, some of our conversations prior to this, we talked about this notion of a digital twin or a virtual twin. And I know uh, Tahira has a, a point of view on, on virtual twin, but why don't we first define what is a digital twin? I, I, I know everybody knows, but so keep yeah. it. <laughs> sure. Sure, yeah, um, I mean, digital twin versus virtual twin. Uh, and a digital twin has existed for many years, right? It could be a representation, a 2D representation of something in uh, electronic format, as simple as that, through to a, a replica of the real world. The virtual twin, which is really you know, we're Dassault Systems, we do a lot of work with our customers on virtual twins. It's about bringing the real world uh, 
you know, really uh, sort of the, the real world into the virtual world, bringing in the data, bringing in the actual uh, activity that's happening in the real world. So whether it's, you know, running what-if scenarios where you don't know the results, you know, unlike in gaming or the metaverse, everything's coded already. You know, somebody at the background knows what the results are going to be. Through a virtual twin, the technology will calculate the results for you. And that's the power of a virtual twin. We're applying this across, for example, maintenance. You know, when you're talking about logistics, uh, you have fleet, you have fixed assets, you have moving assets. You're looking at maintenance and predictive maintenance. You're looking at supply chains, improving your visibility, but also the cost of logistics to reduce your costs of logistics. And of course, demand and supply. This is probably the biggest challenge that's out there, trying to match your demand with, uh, with the, match the supply with the demand given the changing uh, market dynamics. And that's where a virtual twin can help you to really manage uh, that data. So that's so, uh, no, in, no, a, think, in a think, nutshell. I think, I, I think that's helpful. So I first would ask what verticals I, are, uh, I, is my esteemed panel focusing on, because they're all going to be different. And then what verticals are you not doing? I can imagine with, with, for example, satellite, you're not doing remote medical diagnostics. We're not. But can you repeat, sorry? I couldn't hear him. If you can repeat the question, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. The qu what verticals are you focused on, but more uh, specifically, what verticals are you not doing? <coughs> I don't think there's any vertical we're not addressing. Okay. So but there's you'll do, you'll there, do there's remote some, medical. Th yeah, there's some, um, <laughs> some, some verticals that are maybe um, uh, taking it, uh, you know, with more intensity at the beginning. All right. And um, we see a lot of, uh, on logistics, on agriculture, livestock, um, maritime, uh, oil and gas, uh, right. forestry, whatever it is uh, remote and doesn't require really a lot of data. We, we, we cannot transport video. So, but so you're, you're not transporting voice, are you? Or just emergency um, voice? Th 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 would no, but th there are solutions that they can, they can compress a few bytes. A uh, small piece of, uh, of, of voice. I'm stuck on the elevator or something like that. So, yeah. Okay, N Nicholas, you, over to you. Same question. Verticals that you're focused on and verticals that you just don't want to touch. Yeah, so as a connectivity provider, we are pretty generalistic in that sense, but in IoT, we address, let's say, the usual suspects. So asset tracking, which is maybe more horizontal than a vertical, but agriculture, medical devices, point of sale device, that kind of stuff. What we do not do, because we don't do everything, of course, for example, if you need live remote control of your drone, that's not something where we are going to work on because we don't provide real time, a guaranteed real time that kind of solution. But if you are looking for where is uh, the shipment of your new uh, set of drones, the status of that shipment, uh, the status of the drone itself, a kill switch maybe because it has been taken away by someone before coming back to base, that kind of stuff. Those are the use cases we are going to uh, help you address. <coughs> Over to you, same question. Um, mining, uh, ports, airports, logistics areas are our sort of focus. Things we do a little less of is around healthcare, um, agriculture um, type of area, which okay. we really don't sort of focus upon. Is that because of you know where your footprint uh, lies? On, on both sides. So one on the infrastructure side, because that's really where the big spend is. There's a lot of push from government to try and uh, modernize. Uh, on the other end, for things like fishery, agriculture, in our footprint, it's a very fragmented market. It's very small farms, right. uh, you know, small holders who do that. But that's a lot of small farms. Yes, and you know, we're not really sort of good at that uh, right. to, to reach out to do. So would you use partners to we maybe do. help the small farmer or, or an aggregation of, of, of farmers? Uh, we would, and then that's slowly starting to consolidate from an industry perspective too. We're starting to see uh, cooperatives or groupings of the, the smaller farmers, and then it becomes easier to sort of implement tech, see some value around that. Okay. There's a lot more vertical integration through that uh, farming and then poultry industry. Oh, it makes perfect sense. 
So I, one of the things I like to often say is that this is a team sport. You know, Nicholas, I think, set, stated it you know, in, in, in the right way. Which no, nobody can do everything well. So how do you partner, and, I, and we'll just go down the line this time, yeah. how do you partner to deliver a, a solution? How do you team? Yeah. So the easier ones for us are sort of, you know, around IT, ICT transformation that we can sort of do most of that ourselves. When we start to focus on industries, we rely on partners who are more consultative, a bit more strategic, okay. uh, which we do, as well as sort of uh, hyperscalers. We, we rely with people like, um, you know, the AWS of the world. You're, you're reading over my shoulder for my <laughs> next question. <laughs> Thanks for showing it <laughs> yeah. to me, all of the notes to, to do that. So <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to that as a question. Uh, and some go-to-market partners. There are people who are sort of stronger in particular industries to, to do that. So we use them or partner them to, to do that, especially okay. for small farmers and cooperatives around that too. So you'll, you'll create an offering and then uh, land it on a hyperscaler or? Yes. Okay. Uh, and that's predominantly to sort of drive down cost in, in, in uh, doing that. Uh, it turns out to be a lot more of an OPEX model than us investing uh, right. into it. To do it. it makes perfect sense to Hera. Same question. How do you how do you partner? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a it's a difficult question actually because That's why I asked it. <laughs> data systems being in uh, twelve industries, uh, we have partners. We have a lot of partners. Um, but if I was selfish and only only talked about the industry that I'm responsible for, uh, logistics, um, focusing on that, obviously. Um, across the multimodal forms of transport, we have a lot of partners, partners from, you know, data providers through to um, partners who, um, you know, um, uh, even on the manufacturing side, you know, uh, where we, we're involved with our partners. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult question because we, we do have a lot of partners. Um, uh, and we recently um, joined forces with Nokia on the 5G, which is obviously a very a hot topic right. um, and providing 5G through a virtual twin uh, is one of the things we're working on. Excellent, Alan. You, you make drones and you make lots of cool stuff. We, how, <laughs> how do you deliver that? How do you team up with somebody? Yeah, we, we, we team up with a lot of people uh, in, in, in different factors. So like we're, we do everything from manufacturing, designing, manufacturing the drones, testing to operating the drones. So at all levels, we've got lots and lots of partnerships. I mean, I think Given the conference we're at, I mean, I'll talk about our, our comms partnership. Um, so we're partnered with a company uh, based out of Ireland, Cubic Telecom, and they actually simplify our comm stack a lot for us okay. by working with the MNOs on our behalf. Um, so that's one of the good partnerships that we have that allows so that's our, an, our that's, activity. that's a leverage the MVNO strategy, yeah. which I, I think Nicholas might like as yeah. well. So for us, it's one solution that gives us access to a broad range of MNOs. Right. So it's well, in the world of today, actually, it's completely different because maybe a century ago, you had to build everything yourself. Right. Now, you need to be very good at one thing and do it very well. You have an a absolutely great ecosystem around on, uh, on uh, what can be commodities that, uh, that you can basically partner with and be the best one on what you're doing. So we are using a lot of partners. And what we're doing is unique, and, and this is the only thing we're doing, which is basically the software, the antenna, and a, a big part of the satellite is done by ourselves. The rest is with, through partners. So what kind of partners would you want? Other operators? So you're here, this is, you know, 17, okay, okay, 18 I, I, I buildings. Okay, well, I, I can give you a lot, lot of, so you, you, you have partners helping you to build the satellites. You have partners to, like SpaceX, to launch the satellite, right. we cannot build our own which, which is really uh, rocket cool. to do it. Um, it will take more time than it, it took to to SpaceX. Um, we are partners for the ground stations. We are partners um, for all the, um, the development of the codes. But specifically, one of the key things when you are a satellite company, if you look around in the history, most of them are not here anymore. So that's very risky. It's a risky business <laughs> space. Uh, so Capital you, intensive. So you, that's the risky business. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's the only one. Eh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the the point is that <coughs> you really need to be um, to be able to sell what you what you have. Right. And when you have uh, a constellation which is Leo, low Earth orbit, you basically cover everywhere 
of the planet. 100% of the planet is covered. You need to have also your sales. Mm. They need to be global. Locally, very strong, but you need to have it everywhere. So one, uh, one the, the key partners that we have commercially are the mobile network operators or the MVNOs. We are not just standard toward the devices. We are also standard toward the MNOs. So we act like a mobile network operator ourselves. So any telecom operator can interconnect with us without any effort, like uh, with a roaming interface. So we are just the extension of the mobile operators. Everywhere there's no coverage. So you would work with his team, as an example? I can work with um, basically everybody, yes. <laughs> Nicholas? Yep, I um, fully agree about what you said about IoT being a team sport and a puzzle that we need partners, we need to leverage this ecosystem to solve this kind of Tetris game somehow. And it goes from network operators for us, so like Satellite, for example, that could help us expand our footprint, module makers, device makers, solution providers, uh, system integrators that will help get down, uh, deep down into the actual verticals with niche expertise. And last but not least, the customers themselves, which we consider a partner because we have a shared interest in seeing them succeed because right. we are not going to succeed as a connectivity provider on our own. And that's sharing that value that we create, that we have the customer extract. So then we can be successful, but it's not like one company can do the whole thing. Oh could, but could you do it well, fast, and at a reasonable cost as well? Right, right. So I'll in again invite, if anyone in the audience has a question, just raise your hand. I know it's difficult in this format. Don't be shy if you do have a question. Irene over there has a microphone, and we'll, we'll, we'll take your question. And in ca in, we'll, we'll keep moving, but in case you do, just let us know. So the big question of the hyperscalers. Friend or foe? How do we, how do we view the hyperscalers? You're smiling, <laughs> so what do you think? How do you work with them? How do you, how do you ensure they don't uh, eat your lunch? They're frenemies. <laughs> frenemies. Um, I hopefully know that there's no hyperscalers uh, here. Uh, I think we, uh, I don't think we've got to the right balance per se. At least I can maybe speak for the region which we work in where there's a huge demand for connectivity, and so then the hyperscalers are clients of us because we need to provide them that. Right. Uh, there's a huge demand on the small and medium businesses, which then we bundle uh, hyperscaler products, M365, GWS. Uh, and there, you know, it's a balance because we are really a channel into market. Uh, we then don't own that relationship with the client when we when we bundle that You, you co-own it or yes, you're- Yes, to, to do that. Or um, so it's at a balance on, on both sides to do that. And I'm sure that there's going to be a period of time where that, you know, coexist. Right. Uh, and also sort of challenges. I mean, the, the, on the compute side, I, I think that the hyperscalers are pretty dominant and then, you know, um, ubiquitous uh, across the region. Around collaborate tools, apps around that, there are enough sort of local flavors which, you know, provide innovative, competitive solutions to so it. So might you balance between different hyperscalers? So there's a workload on GCP and a workload on AWS? And we take that approach on both sides because we are also large consumers of, of uh, hyperscalers. We always take a sort of a multi-cloud approach and we do that to our clients. Uh, we position ourselves into the client as a cloud expert. And we don't say we're a Microsoft expert or a Google expert. Are you, are you a, a cloud agnostic expert? Yes, to a large okay. extent we are. And then, uh, you know, we, we um, help clients migrate from, from one um, um, brand to the other okay. uh, to, to do that. Uh, we carry a lot of optimization tools for each of the hyperscalers to then show what that value is to the client and if they choose to move. Which makes sense. Yeah. So, Nicholas, I'll go over to you. Hyperscalers, friend or foe? Well, I'm in charge of partnerships, so of course everybody's a friend. <laughs> That's the uh, easy answer. And but yeah, of course we are working with them, uh, especially as part of what we provide is simplified cloud-to-cloud -cloud integration. And that's the differentiator that we can provide. And as you said, being as agnostic as possible, even if our funding team is formerly AWS, so we have this background as well, but 
making sure that for our customers, we provide the easy access <coughs> to their cloud infrastructure as possible, and continuity of service. You mentioned GCP. Uh, last year, GCP discontinued part of their IoT offering. That's right. So what we did is making sure that any customer relying on that can easily adapt the infrastructure, switch to another provider if needed, but making sure that in the end, in its ever-changing environment, you can still have continuity of services and not have, having your business putting uh, put upside down with any change. It, you, you bring up a good point, which would be an interesting different panel on what happens when the gen then becomes specific again. But that's not this panel. But, okay. but uh, we went through the same struggles at my company where you know, we've got very, we had a very generic offering and now we're very you know, vertically tar targeted. So Alan, I'll go over to you. Hyperscalers, friend or foe? Oh, friend, definitely enabler. I, I think I would go as far as to say, I mean, um, you, you know, we're, we're Amazon cloud users ourselves and, and that's a massive enabler for us. But I mean, I, I think in the last five years, and the cloud has become more of a commodity. And I think, you know, Google have caught up, Microsoft have caught up with Azure. And I think it makes it much easier to shop around. So there's now many enablers. Um, but no, I mean, I think it's, you, I, a lot of business wouldn't be here today without, without those, those guys. Well, a AWS sort of, you know, this, this, or Amazon specifically, the notion of drone delivery, you know, kind of created the awareness, I think, around the, around the market from, you know, and I think you probably benefit from that a bit. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. So not to get specific on the delivery. Yeah, I mean, uh, Je uh, Jeff, I think, aspect. promised it, I think it's 13 or 14 years ago now that, that, that Amazon would have drones in the sky. I think this year they've started a trial um, for the first time, um, and I think they're planning on about 3,000 deliveries this year. Um, so, yeah, no, I mean, Google, in the same vein, have, a, have, have their wing project, um, which mm -hmm. is probably the most successful um, drone delivery business, and they're currently operating in uh, Australia pretty extensively, and um, small operation in Ireland. Um, but friends of ours, uh, they're great. They help us with regulation. Big companies can open doors that, that we can't. Interesting. Jean-Luc, uh, hyperscalers, render foe. We are hyperscale um, uh, agnostic. No, I have no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on, was that an option? <laughs> Sahara? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we very much work uh, with uh, the hyperscalers. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, differentiation, very important. Um, so they don't eat you for breakfast. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely. And, and will you yeah. manage between, you know, uh, uh, as we were saying, a multi-cloud, you know, different hyperscalers? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. So my. I think we might land on kind of a fun topic, which is the applicability of metaverse to this area. I, I know in, in the satellite area might be interesting, but um, uh, what are you guys seeing in terms of metaverse in enterprise and industrial when it comes to you know, logistics, as an example? I think there's quite a lot of, at least, tech which is related to mobile or mobile usage. It's the, the Rara part used to be with consumer, you know, people right. using it for gaming, for, for uh, individual experience. Uh, and I think that's where it's going to take off initially. Uh, we've seen some industrial use cases where they're manufacturing and areas where they've done that. And it's a great device because you see beyond what the, the visual is, even through material you work with and then cracks to, to do that. So can, can you describe a use case in, there, in that area that yeah. you're actually that's not a POC. We were talking, yeah, Nicholas, I think, exactly. mentioned PLCL earlier on. Um, and this is not something with, which is in our markets, but if you end up going to, like, the Porsche factory, per se, uh, there are a bunch of four or five um, technicians in a unit which are putting things together. And it used to be that they were very visual. They used to read monitors to what they were able to do. And today, they wear uh, masks around them where the readings are you know, visual to uh, them. Right in front of you. Uh, and they're able to then picture what's within the devices as they fix that together. That's just really sort of brought up the speed of, of the production, the quality of the production, bringing down the defects to, to do that. Now, they're still very niche and more you know, higher end type of manufacturing. But I think it's a period of time where that would start to you know, get further down and into that. So, Tahir, I think you want to yeah, jump um, in. Well, yes, because actually exactly what you've described, um, 
Uh, and, and these are not POCs. These are actual customers who are using. These are real deployments. Yeah, real deployments. In fact, if you visit our booth, you'll be able to see an example, exactly that, where you know you have people working remotely in their own locations, but collaborating together in a virtual world. Uh, you know, whether it's from a technician perspective, and we've got an aircraft uh, example of um, sort of managing the the, the whole air aircraft, the build, the design. Uh, the whole equipment, collaborating, making decisions, but virtually, and that's um, that's kind of a real, uh, real world example. Uh, I think it's it's interesting. From a drone perspective, can you man? Uh, would you imagine uh, managing a drone swarm, for example, with Metaverse? Is that yeah? Uh, is that applicable? Have yeah, you tried it? Potentially. I mean, um, like currently, regulation states it's a one-to-one -one operation, and. Um, the permissions that drone companies are going for, particularly in the US, is a one to 20 operation. So even if you get to a one to 100 and fully autonomous, there will always be some form of human oversight. And I mean, why not? The metaverse would be a perfect environment for that. I mean, you get a much more rich sense of data. Um, you know, so yeah, no, it, it, would be, it would be a great experience, I think, for remote pilots um, to be able to pull and drop and drag and see different Nothing different could be more trendy than a dude with a, AR, VR headset yeah. managing yeah. drones in the air. But this, also, this reminds me a little of a Tom Cruise movie yeah. many years ago <laughs> where they're swiping stuff around and waving their arms yeah. around. But, but also then, you can work at home in the metaverse, yeah. which is great for delivery. So Yeah, I like that thought. Um, actually, for us, I mean, we don't, we don't, have, we don't use metaverse, but the, 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 way of the, the, the fact that you s ship to space the satellites, it's like if we think all the time in the metaverse because the it's in space. It's a place where we I've, I've never been. I, I will never be probably. <laughs> so never been in space. It's it's a metaverse there. There was an old TV show that started out with space, the final frontier. <laughs> Maybe my American friends will uh, remember that called Star Trek, the original one, for us older people. Yes. I looked at you for that one. I'm <laughs> sorry. So uh, Nicholas, uh, metaverse and the yeah, applicability metaverse. for your to us that somehow just another interface with the data we discussed earlier on, that you extract this data, and that's a new way to access it, interact with it. So be it metaverse, as you say, a dude with a VR headset, be it a minority report interface, be it someone in front of a boring SCADA dashboard. Those are different interfaces, different ways to interact with the same data in the end. And it, then I would say it's up to operation level, what makes the most sense, Beyond the buzzword, maybe if you want to, you need to raise from investors, maybe Metaverse is the best choice than the SCADA dashboard. The whole thing is what's going to be actually the more efficient and the more appropriate way to interact with this uh, physical data. Perfect. We have 90 seconds left. So before I thank my panel, I just want to give, and I didn't prepare you for this, but quick hit. What's the topic that we're going to talk about next year? Gopi. <laughs> Good and if you don't have one, just move no, to the No, I next. don't have one. <laughs> Virtual twins. <laughs> Virtual twins. Drones? Well, well, everything's 5G this year, so it has to be 7G next year, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the commutation of uh, satellite communication that is happening. Okay. Yeah, clearly, uh, I think non terrestrial options is going to be a big topic and a way to expand the footprint and the way you can communicate beyond Excellent. terrestrial service. Excellent. I want to thank the audience. I want to thank my great panelists again. I want to thank the AV staff. You guys did a great job. Thank you to the GSMA. Thank, thank you. you. Enjoy the rest of the show. <laughs>